Hello and welcome to Compounding Curiosity. I'm your host Kalani Scarrett and this podcast is all about compounding your curiosity alongside my own through thoughtful interviews with interesting guests. For transcripts and detailed show notes, check out the links in the description. Hopefully you're as keen as me to learn something new, so let's get stuck in. All right, how are we doing? My guest today is Juan Zahadi. Juan is the director and CEO of Tapia Partners, which is based in Malaysia. Juan has previous equity research experience within both Malaysia and Indonesia, but interestingly, he did his honours in physics before joining the investment world. So for today's conversation, we cover his investing style on how that's developed, investing in Malaysia, and also a little bit about cricket and physics and how that relates to investing. So I had a ton of fun with this episode, so I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Juan Zahadi. Awesome. Juan, thank you so much for being on today. But from the limited info I could gather from your background, it's not the most typical. You, you've like you've grown up in Malaysia, you've graduated with a degree in physics from Melbourne, and then you're the first person in your family to work in the investment industry, and then now you're the CEO of Tapir Partners. Like, how'd you do it? And yeah, tell me everything. Oh boy. Hi everyone. Hi Kalani. Yeah, it's um, I grew up in Trangganu, an eastern uh, east coast state of uh, Peninsular Malaysia. Uh, I spent I don't know five years in boarding school over there. So uh, after I got out of school, I really don't know what I wanted to do, as we all uh, I assume. But I really like physics. I just like uh, knowing how things work uh, and. Also, being a bit of a smart ass, uh, trying to tell people how things work as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it fascinates me, and I was lucky I had a very good teacher in, in high school. Uh, so, yeah, I just decided to take up physics. A lot of other parents would ask their kid to take up law or medicine or engineering. My parents were a bit more uh, laissez faire. So they just said, ah, do whatever you want. Um, so I decided to get physics and um, I was fortunate enough to be able to get into Melbourne. Um, I did my undergrad there. Melbourne had this funny thing when I was there, they were doing this Melbourne model thing. Um, so after three years, they would ask you to take um, a master's degree instead of an honors uh, year, instead of doing an honors year. I decided I didn't want to do master's so I went to do an honours year at Monash University, which is just across the river. So yeah, and then from there, uh, I got a good results for my honours. I was offered to do postgrad, but after two years of um, doing postgrad in Monash, uh, I decided it didn't really work for me, uh, so I decided to come back. And when coming back to Malaysia with only a physics degree, there's not a lot of opportunities, or at least it seems to me that it, there wasn't a lot. I guess that's why people ask you to take law, engineering, medicine, accounting, even finance, right? It's a lot easier. But when I got back, I was bumming around for a few months and then uh, my CV was floating around in the ether. For some reason, a few quant firms, they got hold of my email. They contacted me, would you be interested to work in a quant firm? I said, like, oh, okay, I don't know what this part of uh, the world is at all. So I decided to go for it uh, and then read up a bit more about the uh, investment world. And then I realized, oh, investment banks, they kind of hire physics grad as well. Okay, let's give it a shot. So uh, I went into this uh, management associate programs with one of the local banks, RHB Bank, and I went straight into the investment banking arm uh, funny thing was, um, when I first joined, during our first day there, they list down a whole list of investment banking departments. It all sounds very foreign to me, equity capital markets, institutional sales, um, client coverage. I don't know any <laughs> what these words mean at all. But there's one word that caught my eye, research. Research. I've done research before. I think I can do that. And yeah, it's apparently a cell site research. So, so I got into the cell site research department. I was there for about five years. I was covering oil and gas, mainly oil and gas in Southeast Asia, some energy companies, some other small small cap stocks as well, manufacturing, property, 
uh, but my main focus was on the gas. After four or five years of doing that, I started to look out for opportunities. Uh, that's when one logistics service provider in Malaysia, listed company as well, it's called GD Express. Uh, they have a they have a sister company in Jakarta. One of them, one of the management there knows about me and asked me to come and join them uh, to help with the listing process in Jakarta. So I was like, okay, let's do that. So I spent two years in Jakarta uh, preparing the company for an IPO. Eventually, we managed to list it. Um, the company is called PT SAP Express. It's doing very well. And after that, I started to uh, look out for a new challenge. Uh, so I came back to KL, uh, started talking to a few of my cricket friends. Um, yeah, I just got back. Um, I'm wondering what to do next. Uh, and then they said, uh, most of my friends are in the cricket club. Some of them, uh, uh, they have their own fund management. They have their own uh, VC firms. Uh, they tend to have a lot of private investment opportunities presented to them, but they never had the time to evaluate all these things. So they said, why don't you start something? We'll evaluate all this together. If there's something interesting that comes along, we'll invest in it. Sort of like a family office slash mini PE club. So that's how I started Tape Partners uh, with two other of my good cricket friends as well. That's awesome. Cricket brings everyone together. Yeah, exactly. How did you find going from physics to investing? Was there any similarities or? I haven't had to use any of my um, <laughs> technical terms in physics uh, at all. But it sort of helps in terms of the soft skills part. That makes sense. So when you look at a physics problem, you have to look at it from a few angles. You can't just look from one angle. You might not see the whole picture. Yeah, the problem might not uh, be easy for you to solve if you just look at it from one angle. So in that sense, physics sort of like trained me for that, trained you to look at a few angles. Um, and then as a sell side analyst, you have to present your investment case and then say, this is your thesis. but to say that the company is doing such and such and it's going to do well, you have to back, back it up with a lot of data, a lot of uh, other external points. So having done some postgrad work, some honors here, research as well, it really helps a lot with that. I'm trying to come up with a good investment thesis. So how would you define your investing style now then? And maybe how has that developed over time as well? Well, when I first started, I made a lot of bad decisions, <laughs> investment decisions. Uh, so I got my hands burnt a few times. And then after that, I decided, uh, because it's, um, yeah, you hear people talking about these companies, all the speculative companies. So you tend to go, to go chasing after these companies, which is a very bad idea. So after that, I decided, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. Uh, so my investment style currently is very boring. Um, I always go for fundamental uh, analysis from the ground up, um, look at the numbers, what the company is doing and where it's going. I took this cue from one of my uh, investment gurus as well. He's also one of the partners uh, for, for Tape Partners. Every year he will read the annual report of a company that he likes from cover to cover. So that's one thing that I do as well, just to get to know the company in depth, join the AGMs if I'm a shareholder. Um, yeah, it's all very basic, boring uh, investment stuff, nothing fancy about it at all. Just put in the time, read as much as you can. Yeah, no, boring is beautiful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you mentioned getting burnt a few times. Has there ever been a lowest low of your investment journey? Like, has there been an experience that really questioned what you were doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so at the start, my capital wasn't that big. It was still, uh, it was small. Um, but losing all your capital trying to chase a very speculative investment um, yeah, that was that was the low. Uh, that was it. That was the turning point. Yeah, at that point, I told myself no more, no more of this speculative investment. Yeah, just just no more for me. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And maybe having come to investing a little late compared to maybe some of your peers who started in their teenage years or have families involved with it, are there any aspects of investing that maybe you feel easy or natural to you? I guess um, one thing is, I, I think with investment, it's a non-stop learning process. I think nothing comes easy. You really have to put in the time. You really have to put in the work. Go through the annual reports. Go, go follow them closely, uh, their quarterly reports. Uh, so I wouldn't call myself an expert at this stage at all. I think there's still a lot to be learned. One thing why I think talking to people who's been in the industry for so long also helps is because one company may, be, may have been listed for about 10, 15 years and now it's on a good growth trajectory. But you're wondering why isn't people buying the stock? Uh, why is the share price not going up? So you talk to a few people and then you find out. And then you find out, oh, actually in the past they've had a history of false disclosure or something like that. So people tend to not touch this name. So yeah, having experience is one thing uh, and also doing the hard work. Uh, yeah, that's the investment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Is there anything you totally avoid? Like you mentioned false disclosures. Is there anything else like, I don't know, dodgy management? Is there anything you just will not touch? Um, yeah, I, I know ESG is a very um, popular term right now. But even when I was covering oil and gas and my job was to promote oil and gas companies, uh, there's always this thought at the back of your mind. How long is this going to last? How long is this oil company is going to last? So in the same vein of thought, I try to look for sustainable companies, uh, companies that, yeah, the management cares about the shareholders, not a lot of uh, related party transactions, uh, the balance sheet looks out. Sector-wise, I don't think there's anything I wouldn't touch. But yeah, it really depends on the management disclosure and all those things. Yeah, no, interesting. And you touched on ESG, and to Beer Partners has mentioned that ESG plays a big part in its consideration. And I'm reading from your website here. We believe culture and transparency will support the long-term viability of an organization and in turn increase shareholder value. So what does that mean and what do you look for in terms of ESG? So we have a a few criteria that we go through before we start to look at a company. So I will have investment proposals put up to me. And yeah, the criteria is, is this a sustainable business? Uh, is this going to hurt the environment? Is this environmentally friendly? How are they giving back to the community? Those kind of big picture answers, uh, big picture type of questions, sorry. And if that gets the green light or a semi-green light, then we will go on to the management. For us, the sustainability part and the governance part also comes into this. We think it's very, very important to know whether we can have a coffee or a drink or a just dinner, lunch with the management of a company, with the founder, um, and see how we get along with uh, in that session. Because... Yeah, it doesn't matter how good your business model is, but if we think there's something slightly off about the management, we might not be able to trust you, then we might put the head rate on that. Or we will go even deeper to the company. Yeah, we can go either way. So that's the sustainability and the governance part for us. Uh, and that's the best thing about investing. You can always just walk away. You don't have to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so sometimes there were a few times we've had companies that were presented to us with very good growth prospects, very good numbers as well. But sitting down with the management or doing a quick background check online, oh yeah, this company, the director has been <laughs> suspended because of this or some other activities or records. So should we walk away even though it's very tempting it's a very good company uh, I mean it's a very good business model fair enough and so what does your idea generation look like is it whatever comes across your desk or um, yeah just walk me through it okay for the private investment side yeah our idea generation is uh, can be varied it can be my friends 
coming up to me telling me, oh, there's this great guy who's doing something, you should go and talk to him. Or people might have heard of what we are doing because of my two other partners as well, uh, James Hay and Ascari Stevens. They are quite well known in the investment community in Malaysia. So people will approach us uh, because of these two as well. Yeah, or they themselves, they might have heard something or people might be passing them investment proposals. So they'll just pass it on to me first without even taking a look at it. Just one, you go through this. <laughs> Do the work for me. <laughs> yeah, that's usually how it goes actually. Do you find it hard ever switching from private to public? Like, how do you balance that? I, I think, um, I hope this is not too controversial. I think investing in public is slightly easier compared to trying to invest in, a, in the private space. Public, you will have a lot more information. The disclosures are there. You just go to a website, you can see all the annual reports, all the quarterly report, and you can Google them. There'll be a ton of searches uh, about the companies, so you can uh, make a more objective uh, decision on trying to invest in these things. Whereas for private investment, especially for the smaller companies that we are working with, there's not a lot that you can depend on. Some companies, their business process is just not quite there, so the finance number, the audit numbers might not tell the full picture. I still you sit down with the owner or you go visit the company, look at how their business process uh, looks like, do a proper audit from a, a legal audit as well as financial audit, uh, which takes up a lot more time compared to investing on the public side. So those are the main difference, I think, yeah, the time and effort you have to put in. So then... Is there even a type of typical day for you? Are you on the road half the time talking to management or? I have to say there's no typical day. Uh, it really depends on what needs to be done uh, for the day or for the week. Uh, sometimes I'll be over at an, at an invested company. I'll spend the whole day there um, and then try to help them with their business process, uh, especially uh, yeah, their, their finance, their HR process. Uh, sometimes even their operations as well. I don't mind getting my hands dirty. I, I love doing these kind of things. And on some days, uh, it can be a bit slow as well, which is good for me. Uh, I get to sit at my desk and uh, crunch numbers or uh, do some admin work, uh, clear the mind a bit. And yeah, probably spend a bit more time looking at the public markets, yeah, uh, trying to see any uh, interesting ideas that come up. Yeah, cool. So you're sector agnostic, but you're purely focused on Malaysia, right? So what do Malaysian companies offer that you can't find elsewhere, maybe in the region, do you think? We are sector agnostic. That's, that part is uh, certainly accurate. Um, but done some private investments outside of Malaysia, actually. Actually, the latest one uh, that we did is Maritime Academy based in Phuket. So... That was the first um, overseas investment uh, that we did. So uh, there are some other regional uh, opportunities as well. But uh, yeah, what was the second part of your question again? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. So yeah, well, <laughs> no, you're right. What, so what can Malaysian companies offer that maybe you can't find elsewhere? Ah, oh, I see. I guess it's, um, it's the proximity. Uh, no other reason why we tend to focus more on Malaysia. And also because um, I'm more familiar with the Malaysian market as well. Um, and also there's a network that uh, we can tap. Let's say there's a manufacturing company doing some electronics. I can just go up to a friend who's um, either covered the industry before or is um, running an electronics company. I can just say, so how's this company? Have you heard of them? Uh, Etc. So trying to do the same for a company based in Jakarta uh, during pandemic times, uh, it's a bit more difficult. You really have to rely on your, on your limited network in the regional countries. Like for example, the Maritime Academy Phuket, which we did. Uh, we came across it by chance actually. Uh, one, of my, one of my partners, he sent his, um, his employee to go do a super yacht course. And then 
she came back and said oh it's a great academy uh, all those things and then the owner of the academy asked us um, uh, ask her what what does he uh, what does your employer do for a living? Say, so, oh, he manages a fund. Oh, that's good. We are fundraising right now. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, and then from there, um, having to do due diligence in a <laughs> in a in COVID times is a bit weird, but luckily we've had one eyewitness. Uh, she went there uh, to the earth, and also we have a few friends based in Phuket, based in Bangkok, which we can ask about how things are going. Uh, we can't. So the only issue with this investment is I've never stepped foot in Phuket <laughs> for the due diligence at all, which is a bit <laughs> weird right, for conducting a due diligence. But yeah, it, it's worked out well so far, but it's prob- probably in a more open world once uh, in, in this COVID time. Uh, we don't have to rely on, on our network so much. We can actually go there, kick the tires, which is what we prefer anyway to do. Yeah, no, that's cool. And selfishly for myself, I'd love to know, like with your network, how have you gone about building it? Any advice for other young professionals building their network? Um, <laughs> personally, join a cricket club <laughs> or uh, join any sporting organization that you can find. Uh, yeah, that's one thing. Or join your alumni organization. Uh, that's also helpful. Yeah, and don't be shy to ask questions. Uh, you'll be surprised that people are actually very helpful to answer, especially a, a young person coming up uh, to you asking questions. Hey, how do you do this? How do you? Can I get to know what you guys are doing? All those kind of things. Um, can I be? Uh, can I do an internship? Yeah, just ask these kind of questions. Don't be afraid. And join a cricket club, of course. Oh, mate, yeah. next time I'm in Malaysia, I'll be there at the Nets bowling your pies. Come, come over, come over, yeah. definitely. Come over. We'll definitely. I'll get that yeah, warmed up. It's been a while, but yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's been too long, yeah? <laughs> Just as long as the shoulder stays in place. <laughs> Straight on. Yeah. yeah. So having met the legend that is Brian Lara and your interest in okay. cricket, is there any similarities between cricket and investing? Um, I am... I have to say I'm bad at this uh, because I'm I, I'm not a batsman. I'm more of a bowler. What do you bowl? Um, pies. <laughs> pies. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, well, medium pace. Okay. Uh, it's not great medium pace, but... Uh, we try our best. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm bad at this uh, because in batting, you really need to focus. Don't do stupid shots. Know where all the players are. That kind of thing. I, 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 it's something I'm still struggling with, and trying to get that type of mindset, that focus into my own professional work. I can do it, but I think there's a greater level of focus that I can achieve if I just put my mind to it. So yeah, having uh, Playing cricket, you have to be at the crease for quite some time. You have to think, focus, all those things. Yeah, if I can just translate that to my professional life, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting that you bring up focus as well because um, a little tidbit that's honestly like kind of changed my life. So you know Greg Chappell, previously ca- oh, Captain yeah. Australia? Yeah. Yep. He spoke about he was struggling for a while with focus but he was focusing all the time. It was only when he learned to switch off between balls and he, and then when the bowler ran in and just before he bowled, then he had hyper-focus and then he felt, he'd be, you're like, because otherwise he'd just drain out, be too tired. So you've got to pick and choose your times when to focus. That for me was like, wow. Yeah, it, it, well, okay, all right. I have a game this weekend actually. Okay, I'll, I'll play that. I'll follow up. I'll follow up on the next weekend. <laughs> but yeah, it makes sense because what's the point of focusing when the ball's already gone to the keeper? You know what I mean? Like... Just switch off, and then when it comes back, then you're really... Because otherwise, yeah, you're just on alert all the time and you'll burn out. Yeah, and uh, one issue I have as well is I get into the sledging, which comes to the focus part as well. Because when the others are chattering behind me, talking, um, yeah, making fun of my batting and everything, I tend to join in. (laughs) Yeah, of course, I can't bat. What else do you expect? But that takes the edge off a bit. Yeah, you tend to, because you, you get a bit more relaxed, and then I, I find it 
I realized that I lose focus a bit uh, in terms of that. So, yeah. I love it. Gotta love it, though. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I hope this doesn't bore your listeners. Uh, the two of us just talking about cricket. No, it's still investment related. Like, you're still focused on investing. But, yeah, I got a few Australian listeners. They'll enjoy it, I'm sure. Okay. All right. cool. um, maybe to bring it back, any particular sectors or companies that have really taken interest lately? Like you mentioned the one in Phuket, um, anything else? On the private side, um, not really. Currently, we have one company, uh, electronics manufacturing company, which we are looking at uh, based in Singapore, but they have global MNCs as their client. Uh, so that's one thing that I have on my plate right now that's on the private side on the public market side there's this company which uh, which has been doing quite well it's a commodities based company this is not a, a paid advertisement by them at all <laughs> it's a company called press metal they're an aluminum uh, manufacturer based in East Malaysia they have a cheap source of energy so uh, there's a big hydropower dam very close to their location, so uh, they are one of the lowest uh, energy uh, uh, aluminium producers uh, in the world. So, yeah, I'm trying to read up more on the company. Uh, I think it's interesting because as we move to a world of where people want everything to be lightweight, uh, as material science progresses um, and uh, EV cars are more prevalent, I think aluminum will be a lot more in demand and having the lowest cost base could potentially be very good for this company. Uh, yeah, still trying to uh, read up more on this company. Yeah, no, interesting. I love it. And maybe for people like myself or outsiders looking into Malaysia, is there any advice you'd give for those investing for the first time and maybe what to avoid as well? I think Malaysia is not a very popular investment uh, destination uh, for the past few years because of the political upheaval, the 1MDB scandal. So we don't have a yeah, good reputation around the world right now. But what I can say is I think it's uh, it's still a stock picking type of investment uh, that you can do in Malaysia. There are still some gems uh, that are still waiting to be discovered. And also I read the statistics the other day, foreign participation in Malaysian stocks are at its uh, all-time low, or something similar to that. Uh, so once foreign investors start looking again at Malaysia, because valuations are getting cheap, so I think the tide will turn to the population. Uh, assuming we manage to take care of our yeah, political side of things, <laughs> which is still quite messy. Yeah. No, I think I saw your partner James share something similar about foreigner participation in Malaysia. It's just, but the valuations seem nice. So it's kind of what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think the the discount that people give to Malaysia is still quite, still quite big right now. But yeah, over time, we think the discount should come down. Yeah, because there are some companies out there that are doing very well. Uh, the growth prospects are looking very good. It's just a matter of taking notice of them. Yeah, oh, fair enough. Maybe to move in my closing round of questions that I ask everyone, what do you think is the most undervalued life experience that university age students don't give weight to? Like, what do you think is an underrated skill or an experience? Like yourself, you studied abroad. I'm very jealous. What's been fundamental to you? Yeah, uh, studying abroad is actually great. Yeah, I still have lifelong friends uh, in Melbourne and all over uh, Australia and some, yeah, even across the world. I would have to say, make friends. Uh, don't just stay in your own room. Be content with playing video games, which is what kids these days do, or, or just wanting to read books. Um, reading books is awesome. Uh, it's lovely, but... Talking to other people, uh, getting more friends, networking, nothing can beat that. And also, one more thing, if I'm, uh, yeah, if I'm still in undergrad, what I would do is I would take up more courses which are not related to my major at all. I'll probably take up more history courses, or because I'm a huge history nerd, um, or maybe some philosophy courses because. I cannot understand what philosophy is uh, up until now. I've tried to read a few books, but it's 
just very hard for me to get through. So maybe having some background in philosophy would, be, would, would make me able to understand a few more interesting concepts and see how people think. Or even do, I don't know, take a course in psychology, a subject in psychology. Those kind of things. Um, expand your mind. Yeah. And it's, and it's amazing what else links as well. Something totally random in history can apply to today. Exactly. Yeah, history is awesome. Yeah, I can go on and on, but uh, I, I shouldn't. <laughs> no, you're right. You're welcome to. <laughs> yeah, I bet I'm going to get some good recommendations here. So what has there been any books that have been influential in shaping your worldview? Oh, boy. I know this is a very, it's very cliche, but Intelligent Investor, Benjamin Graham, I think, Every investor worth their salt should read that book, especially if you're a, a, a value investor. Uh, I think that will help you, guide you to what things you should be looking at. Yeah, that's the, that should be the invest, investment bible for everyone, right? History, if I can touch a bit on history books, uh, there's this, <laughs> there's this, uh, uh, on the Malaysian history side, oh, sorry, on the Malaysia and Singapore history side, there's this great book by Jim Baker called Crossroads. It tells the history of Malaysia from uh, ancient times up until current times. And it's quite detailed as well, which is great for me because uh, our history education at schools is quite lacking. So we did not learn enough about it. Uh, the period, uh, the immigration period, uh, the British came over and what they did. Uh, they brought in a lot of immigrants and how uh, we are trying to integrate this uh, to our society, which we are still having problems up to this day, in a way. So for a student of history or anyone who's interested to understand the current social dynamics in Malaysia, I think that's a very good, uh, Malaysia and Singapore, I think that's a very good starting point on a more probably global type of history. There's this book that I finished a few months ago. It's about immigration of US citizens to the Soviet Union uh, during revolution times. So during, it started in 1917-ish, all the way to uh, 1930s. So it's strange. Uh, we only thought that uh, Soviet citizens were running away from communism going to the US, but actually there's a huge influx of immigrants going into the uh, Soviet zone because they believe in communism and all those things. But for the life of me, I can't remember the name of the book. <laughs> I need to send you a, I'll, I'll send you a link. I'll send you the name of the book uh, later. Uh, I hope that's okay. And one more recommendation I would tell anyone to read is uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, I hope I'm pronouncing his name properly. <laughs> it took me a while to read that book. It took me about six months to finish that. But it's great, I think, especially for someone in, in management or even having a professional career. If you, you can gain a lot of insights into how other people think and how you should think as well uh, at the same time. Uh, so yeah, uh, I would recommend anyone to read that book. They might read, finish it faster than me, but... I took, I took my time. <laughs> Thinking fast and slow, reading fast and slow. It's okay. <laughs> I guess so. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, reading fast and slow. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, just to wrap up, um, so any plans or visions for the next five to 10 years or in the future? Maybe for yourself and both for Tapir Partners? Like what's, yeah, what's in the wheelhouse? I think uh, in five to 10 years time, uh, probably we'll have a bit more free reign what we want to do uh, we can we can choose a bit more i guess at this initial stage uh, we also want to build up our reputation and our word of mouth so uh, rejecting companies that don't suit uh, our investment philosophy 100 percent is great but uh, there's also the business side of things as well so sometimes that uh, that's a conflict right uh, between choosing this might be contradictory to what I'm saying earlier, um, but yeah, trying to put companies uh, founders down, uh, telling them no. There's a there's a way, there's an art to do that as well. Uh, don't burn your bridges, kind of thing, right? So maybe in the future uh, we get to choose more of what we really want to do. Uh, a vision, also uh, a vision. What 
of where we want to take the company, we would like to give back to the community. So probably in five or ten years' time, uh, we'll be at a position where we'll be able to afford to set up a scholarship for uh, underprivileged kids uh, in this uh, in Malaysia, send them uh, for uh, overseas education. I, that, that's my that's my vision. Yeah, no, that's a perfect way to wrap up and. No, one, cheers a million. And honestly, I cannot wait to get to Malaysia and see some of these pies. I bet you're going to bounce them. <laughs> if he bounces galore. <laughs> Bodyline series. <laughs> yeah, Bodyline. Exactly. As long as I have a helmet, I'm happy. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. Oh, man, I have to wear a helmet as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but honestly, thank you so much for today. I've had a blast. Oh, yeah. It's been a pleasure as well. Yeah, it's been fun. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, be sure to check out the website compoundingpodcast.com. On the website, you'll find every episode complete with transcripts, show notes, and other related resources. If you want an email notification every time an episode releases, plus my lessons and takeaways from each episode, be sure to sign up to the Substack. So that's compoundingcuriosity.substack.com. Either way, links to all content mentioned today will be in the description below. And you can also connect with me on Twitter, at Skarrett But until next time, have a good one.